Okay, we'll start. Hello, everyone. Good evening in Australia. Thanks for joining us today in this Aussies and Israelis Talk Environment webinar. And although COVID-19 seems the most dramatic event on the planet in the past few months, and it's definitely altered our lives in many, many ways, we should all remember that this pandemic is one of many zoonotic diseases that plague humankind because of our altered relationship with the natural environment. And we'll circle back to this point at the end of this session. Our webinar today is about some of the environmental challenges that our planet and the human population face and which will have far reaching impacts on humankind. We're all in the same boat and in addressing the challenges ahead, we have much to learn from each other. Although Australia is over 300 times bigger than the state of Israel, there are many similarities. A large part of our countries is desert. Water scarcity is a challenge in many parts of our countries. Many of the animals of Australia and of Israel are threatened with extinction, and climate change is a particular challenge in both our countries with very complex repercussions. Several months ago, I spoke in an event organized by JNF to raise funds to help the World Wildlife Fund protect wildlife in the wake of the huge fires that raged last year in Australia. I have now been invited by the Australian Academy of Science to take part in a symposium on fire and conservation. So this webinar is part of an ongoing dialogue on Israeli and Australian environmental challenges on two major ones, climate and water. We do welcome questions from the audience. So if there's something that you would like to ask or contribute, please write and we'll leave a few minutes towards the end of the webinar to address your comments and questions. At this point, I'd like to ask our two speakers to introduce themselves in a few words. First, Professor Dror Avisal of the Porter School of the Environment and Earth Sciences. Dror, please. Good evening, Australia. I'm very happy to be here and to talk with you. I hope you have a good winter. Uh, we have a strong summer here. Uh, I'm uh, actually the head of the hydrochemistry laboratory at Tel Aviv University and the head of the water research center at Tel Aviv University. And uh, as I told, happy to talk with you this, this evening. Okay, thank you. And our second speaker is Professor Marcelo Sternberg of the School of Plant Sciences and Food Security. Marcelo. Thank you very much, Tamar. I'm very pleased to be this evening with you in this unique opportunity to have uh, the chance of sharing ideas of common challenges that we're facing at uh, this time of a unique time for humanity. In my background, you can see one of the un unique experimental stations on climate change research, one of the longest uh, world rainfall manipulation experiments uh, that if you come here to Israel, I will be most happy to show you around and see the facilities we are doing in our experimental site. I'm an ecologist. I work on climate change for the last 25 years. I'm pleased to share with you some ideas. And I'm the Robert Rayner Chair for Environmental Conservation Research. And I make this point because this chair was a gift from the Australian Friends of Tel Aviv University. And also I head the Steinhardt Museum of Natural History and the Australian friends have helped us with two major gifts from Millie Phillips and from the Erdi Foundation. So there are already many links to Australia and to the Australian friends and we're very grateful. And if you've not yet visited our museum, do come. And I'll begin with a question for Professor Marcelo Sternberg. Marcelo, how is climate change expected to affect the natural and agricultural ecosystems in Israel? Well, the challenge is, uh, thank you so much for the question, the challenge is indeed a very, very strong one. Uh, prediction for climate change in our region, we're talking about uh, increasing temperature, and we are increasing at the double the rate of the world scale. In the world, we are already having an increase of 1.1 uh, 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 degrees centigrade, and in our region, we're already above 2 degrees. So that's from one point of the, what we expect already, we're feeling the increase in temperature and a decrease in rainfall. So we, we are, we're expecting drought 
And the combined effect of increasing temperature and less rainfall are getting a deficit in water on the soils. And that is evidence uh, in many areas in Israel where we've already seen uh, forest die back uh, because of uh, consecutive years of uh, drought. Uh, we're seeing also natural areas where the shrubs that are already adapted to dry conditions are completely uh, dry up. And uh, this major change in some areas in the northern Negev where the vegetation of the system is changing completely. And uh, we also consider this effect of the combined of increasing uh, temperature and, and less rainfall, all also the areas that they are used for rangelands. So I mean, cattle grazing and sheep grazing, uh, if we look on the point of what we call it, the, the, the rain-fed agricultural ecosystems uh, are suffering quite a lot because we have less, uh, less rainfall. And in particular, in our region, considering that we have a Mediterranean type of climate, the one you have more or less in Perth, uh, with rainfall in winter and long and dry summer, uh, the expectation of a reduction of the green season or the rainfall season is getting shorter and shorter. And the dry spells within this rainfall event is increasing. So the, the deficit in water in these systems uh, is, is increasing and definitely that's affecting the forage capability of these pasture lands, of grazed lands, uh, range lands, as we call it uh, also in Australia, uh, of uh, having a major effect. That's on the terrestrial fine point, but also on the freshwater ecosystems, we are seeing a decrease in, in, in the amount of water, for example, what's around the Kinneret uh, Lake uh, watershed. All this area has been increased, decreased in the last 30 years, more than 30% of the amount of water that is getting into the lake through the watershed, through the natural watershed. And that's something that the trend is showing us a sharp decrease. That's for the fresh water ecosystems that are quite sensitive in our region. And if we consider the marine ecosystems, that's also a very big story and a major changes because of the increasing of, uh, of temperature. Already in the Eastern Mediterranean, we have an increase of almost uh, three degrees above the last, uh, the anomaly for the last 50 years. And if we go, in, we go here to the beach in, in summer, we can reach temperatures of 31 degrees, of 21 degrees Celsius. So it can be that the, in the evening, is warmer in the sea than outside the sea. And that's producing major, major changes with invasion of species that are coming from the tropical seas, from the Indian and from the Red Sea, getting through the, the Suez Canal to the Mediterranean and make, making major, major changes of a biological invasion, changing the completely the flora and the, and the, the, the mollusk, the mollusk a com the mollusk communities and the fishes are changing at this rate that were not known before. So we have a, what we call it a tropicalization of the Mediterranean Sea. And these changes are major, major, major and affecting the whole, uh, the whole communities. Not only also the fishermen who are going outside to fish and get the fish, the catch of the fish is getting down and having consequences that we still don't know which will be the major consequences of the cascade effects of these major changes. Thank you, Marcelo. In view of this very serious uh, outlook, what is the government position regarding the climate change crisis? What's Israel doing about it? Is there any national adaptation, climate change adaptation plan in process? I've been in the business of climate change research for many years now. And regrettably, the amount of uh, funds that the governments, that all the governments in Israel has been putting in, in research around climate change, uh, research of, on climate change has been unfortunately very little. Most of the funds that we got for doing climate change research are coming from a cooperation between uh, foreign countries uh, and, and European Union, funds and uh, the, 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 unfortunately the government 
uh, did not yet invest the necessary amount of money to get the infrastructures that we need to, to get in, in real research in, in our region. Different from Australia, but in Australia, the fund, the governmental funding has been much more important compared to here. Uh, and the, the excuse that, well, we, we are a visual little country that the, our major input on the global climate change effect is very little, so not much necessary can be done, and that's type of excuses that uh, affect our uh, community, research community, since we still don't know what's going to happen, and much research uh, is needed, both in, in infrastructures, that, uh, like the one that you see here behind me, the, that they're the only ones uh, that have currently been in Israel and the whole Middle East. So from the point of view, uh, considering our position of Israel, confronting European, we are on the front edge of the desert. So that's the information we are obtaining here from our research is very, very important for all what the predictions that we may expect for Europe, for example, that they're expecting drought as in our region, but we're on the edge of the desert and all the information we can provide can be crucial for them for getting policies and recommendations management of the natural resources. And uh, here, here we're also very keen on having this type of information, giving this type of information and providing the information to the government, to the local government on how to potentially adapt to, 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 the, to the, the climate, to the changes that we're expecting, both on climate and land use and sea use. The three elements are what we call the global changes. And these are major, major challenges that we still don't know much on, on what's going to happen, unfortunately, due to the lack of funds. Okay, well, is climate change affecting Australia and Israel in a similar manner? Uh, yes, definitely, yes. Um, the, the bushfires that you that the Australia recently, unfortunately, suffered uh, due to the consequences of uh, extreme heat waves and the dryness of the soil is something that also we see here. And we were evident uh, both in, in Australia and in here in Israel, the extent of fire. That's something that we're going to happen and to, to join us and probably give us a, a, a many, many challenges to go ahead, how to manage our forest how to manage and to combine in very in this very dense country. We will differently like in Australia that the density, the population of the, the location of the age of the forest within the urban areas or the suburban areas are relatively farther uh, in, 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 in Australia. Here, all the, all the cities and the suburbs and the moshavs and the kibbutz are inserted in, within this matrix of forest and the, the, the challenge is quite a, a strong one. Similar like the eucalyptus, that they have secondary compounds that, the, that provoke or so has to enhance the intensity of the fire. Also our, our pines in Israel are, let's say, evolutionarily built to be burned. So because of the concentration of contents of uh, secondary compounds, of components and terpenes that they have in leaves, the, the intensity of the fire when they get into the, the canopy of the trees and you have these like balls of fire that they are jumping between trees, something that also has been seen in Australia, uh, the challenges are, are very, very much. As well, the things that you see in the, in, in the, the coral areas in, in Western Australia uh, were the bleaching effect. And we have also in the Red Sea some elements of some years of bleaching of the coral bleaching. Uh, but fortunately for us, the, our corals in the Red Sea are much more resistant than the corals, uh, the coral reef in Australia. That we see the recurrency of bleaching effect due to increasing temperature as having major, major effects. And the recurrency of these effects are seen uh, also this year. This year with the coronavirus and the COVID, we've seen a major bleaching effect uh, along the whole uh, Western area of the coral reef in Australia with major consequences that we still don't know 
with the cumulative effect of how this affects the full, uh, the full uh, food web, what we call it, of this type of system. The challenges definitely are similar. I should add to what you say, Marcelo, and that is Australian ecologists actually had plans to deal with fire. It's just that the scale of the fires was something that nobody could have anticipated. And it's something that, you know, we, we, we don't know how to deal from our own personal experience, our own scientific experiences. And it seems to be that the challenge of climate change is somewhere outside of our experiences of something that we've actually been planning for in the past. So the whole scale of the phenomenon is humongous. Um, I will ask the next question, I will address Dro. And clearly climate change involved changes in the water economy in general and in Israel, where it's extremely challenges, challenging in particular. So first Dro, how are we in terms of water quality in Israel before we even talk about quantity? How are we standing with the quality of the water? So we have uh, actually the main sources of pollution, like most of the developed and developing countries has around the world. Uh, most of the, this pollution comes from uh, industrial sources, agricultural sources, and mainly from domestic wastewater. Uh, the domestic wastewater, the, the, the sewage, the wastewater we are producing at cities, uh, this is the main source of pollution in the environment in most countries. And um, this is the main uh, pollution that affecting the water quality, the drinking water quality, uh, seawater quality, aquatic systems around streams, rivers, lakes, etc. Uh, so if it's common, why there is differences? There is differences because of uh, um, two main reasons. One is the regulations. Uh, there is places the regulation is more severe and, uh, and there is a good enforcement. And there is places that there is no regulation at all. Uh, in the way to Australia, we can pass through India and they have a lot of uh, industrial, agricultural and domestic wastewater and there is no systems and there is no regulation. The second and the main thing that uh, differ between or amongst countries that there is a control on contamination or there is a mass of contamination um, is the management. If there is management, there is order, there is a way to cope with all these uh, contamination sources. In countries, there is no um, management, uh, water management, uh, water contamination management around seawater and groundwater and, and surface water. Uh, the, the aquatic systems, the terrestrial aquatic system, the mar marine aquatic system and groundwater as a main source of drinking water became worse and worse and we can follow upon the deterioration. Thank you for that. Now, I am curious because water issues are huge issues in Israel and have been so for decades with the growing population in Israel. There's a huge pressure on the water uh, uh, sources. And how historically has Israel coped with chronic water scarcity and contamination? What are we doing about it? This is a <clears throat> very good question. Uh, because we can divide it to contamination and then to scarcity, uh, and we can evolve them together. So if we talk about pollution, uh, I have to admit that Israel till the mid 90s was um, that the contamination, surface water contamination, groundwater contamination was severe and we were like a developing country. Most of the surface water in Israel was contamin were contaminated uh, severely. Uh, people here probably remember the Maccabiya in 97 in the Arkon River, the disaster that the Australian people were killed and severely injured uh, because of the contaminated water in the river. And uh, so Israel was in a deep problem regarding uh, pollution for many, many years. I remember the, the, the way that the days that I was younger and tried to hike in many, many rivers, streams, and lakes in Israel, most of them were contaminated with wastewater. The change came in uh, something around 93 in the Rabin government when he was the first prime minister to, uh, to address the, the problem of uh, wastewater and to understand that the main problem of, uh, of water in Israel is the pollution derived mostly 
from domestic wastewater. This domestic wastewater, because as you say, Tamar, the population grows, producing more pollution, more, more wastewater. This wastewater with no uh, appropriate solution goes through to the lowest place in the environment, to the river streams, groundwater, marine environment, and pollute them severely. And this is what the situation in Israel. Rabin understand it, and he established the sewage or the wastewater authority uh, those days that require and demanding from any municipality, any city in Israel to build the, way, the best available technology wastewater treatment plant by get, giving uh, money from the government and by get, uh, taking more tasks from the uh, population. And this was a huge success. It took like 15 years to stabilize, to reach to a, a appropriate level of, um, or satisfied level of treatment. But I can say that this was one of the main revolution, environmental revolution in Israel regarding the pollution of the environment. And today the situation is much, much better. There is still places to be, to be improved, but the, generally the situation in Israel is much, much better. And more than this, it solved the problem of scarcity as well. Because if we are collecting all this wastewater and we are a, reclaim this water in the high grade, create from the high quality or the highest quality effluent. Effluent is a treated wastewater, uh, almost like drinking water. We can uh, convert drinking water from using for agriculture and using this uh, converting a uh, reclaimed water as the main source for agriculture. The agriculture in Israel in the 19, in the, the beginning, 20, 15 years ago, took around 65, 64% of the annual uh, water consumption. And it was depend only on drinking water. Today, we are giving more, uh, something around 90% uh, uh, irrigation water to the agriculture from reclaimed water, from reuse water. So this is a, a great deal. Israel is the number one country in the world that uh, using reclaimed water uh, in the agriculture. Um, and uh, this was a huge success. Well, there's two questions that come to mind. One is now that we have about two decades of experience with watering agriculture with reclaimed sewage water, are there any effects that we can talk about on the soil, on the groundwater, something that we should think about or study in the future? And beyond that, and it's also came from the audience, living under the reality of climate change, has desalination forever changed the Israeli water budget? Is desalination the optimal solution for water scarcity? And what are the disadvantages? So if you could address both points, please. Uh, so, so let's start with desalination, because desalination is coming after the reclaimed water that I just said, talked about. Uh, desalination is the ultimate and the second solution that Israeli, Israel adopt in order, <coughs> sorry, adopt in order to solve the water, the chronic uh, water scarcity in Israel. Uh, finally, the Israeli government decided to invest uh, money in order to build several big, one of, the, one of them is the biggest in the world, uh, desalination plant along the shoreline, along the Mediterranean shoreline in order to be to supply uh, drinking water and irrigation water for to be stabilized for the population and not to be dependent on droughts, climate change, uh, the area that became arid uh, and, um, and the rain. Uh, so this was a definitely, if I can say, if this was, uh, this changed the Israeli water budget, I can say generally, yes. Uh, but it must be continuously maintained and uh, upgraded. And this is, uh, now we have the, the program for uh, 2050 in order to upgrade more um, uh, desalinate, desalinated uh, water and more desalination plants around the shoreline in order to supply the water, drinking water for the increasing population uh, for the next tw uh, 20, 30 years. And of course, it must uh, be enough <coughs> as well for the neighbors of Israel, because today Israel is, uh, must supply uh, water for the Palestinian Authority and several countries around Israel that suffering uh, from a severe scarcity, 
like Syria in the future, we hope someone will move there. And of course, Jordan, we are supplied to Jordan, to the Republic of Jordan, uh, uh, many um, liters of water annually, uh, something around 50 million cubic meters per year uh, from the Lake of the Galil, from the Kinneret. And uh, we hope uh, to, to give them more because uh, Jordan is in a big scarcity. And if we're talking about geopolitical issue in the area, water is one of the issues that can solve all these issues. Uh, so there is several uh, dis disadvantages regarding the using of uh, desalination. First, we have to still uh, keep on on our natural resources as a backup. And one of the biggest afraid uh, that when you have enough artificial source of water, you are neglecting uh, the natural resources, the natural groundwater, and the natural groundwater are feeding the springs, the springs feeding the aquatic environment, the, the, the river, the streams, uh, and the marine, uh, marine springs and uh, lakes. We have only one lake in Israel, actually. Uh, so this is, um, must be kept. We have to still taking care of our um, 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 surface water and groundwater natural sources. Uh, we have to remember that um, the um, uh, artificial source of uh, uh, like uh, desalination, there is a high energy consumption. It's taking a precious coastline area because any plant take close certain place of the, of the coast area. Um, it's uh, related to water security issue because it became a very sensitive spot in Israel from a political issue uh, that terror organization and other enemies country uh, can uh, aim to and want to, to, to damage in a, in a war. Because imagine yourself that we have a missiles attack and uh, several of our uh, um, desalination plant damage became damaged and shut down. This will be a problem for water supply in Israel. So we are depending on this artificial source. Uh, we have to deal with water security, both terror attack and cyber. A few weeks ago, there, were, uh, there was a cyber attack at Israel water facilities, and some of them are trying to attack the water uh, desalination plant. So this is the issue that Israel today giving a lot of attention to. Um, and uh, one of the interesting subject is that sometimes the desalinated water, if it's not treated after, uh, there is a lack of magnesium and calcium to the water, and it can cause some um, uh, health effect to the people because water was one of the main supply to the society of Israel uh, for, uh, regarding magnesium uh, uh, as an additive. And uh, we, when, the, when we are using more drinking water as a desalination source, we are getting less and less magnesium and there is a lot of cardio problem, more cardio pro problem. Additionally, uh, this uh, poor water regarding salts and ions uh, became more cor corrosive water. And this will, can attack uh, old pipes and we can see increasing of uh, heavy metal, toxic metals, in drinking water facilities because of using more corrosive uh, water. The solution is the same. We have to add calcium and magnesium to the water. And um, potentially there is, if you talk with several marine scientists, they can say it will damage the marine environment. Some of them, and according to the, to the information we have today, it's still not proven yet, but it's something that we have to be aware of if we are damaging by putting back to the, to the ocean, to the Mediterranean, the concentrate, concentrate feel, uh, it's a concentra huge concentration of salt we are back, uh, putting back to the ocean. And for a long term, it may damage and change the, ecosystem, the marine ecosystem. And we have to take care of this as well. Thank you, Dro. Marcelo. Your comment, just, please. I want to comment briefly, briefly. Um, I agree with the, all the, the comments that Roar said about that. We have, but we have to remember that Israel has the highest density 
of the desalinization plants in the world. That's the scale. Our coastal shore is the highest density of desalinization, and we still don't know what the accumulative effect of the brine, which is the, the, the secondary effects of the, of the waste of these, uh, of these sanitation plants, because there's no place in the world with such a high density. And yeah. another element that is important to consider that there are no free land and well with the energy production, because we are producing this water by burning fusel foil, fusel oil, uh, fossil oils. So mainly is due to gas and also to coal, that we are still producing much of our energy. We have no very little solar energy, despite that Israel is leading in producing technology for exporting on solar panels, but our energy production in solar is only a tiny fraction of the total energy, annual energy that we're producing. And as um, another element as well, we are seeing the effects of the accumulative effects of using wastewater on the roots of the, of the trees that have been watered. The accumulative effect of this uh, type of water, uh, bad water, let's say, for the plants, that the, the root system is being encroached in, some, in several locations, mainly in orchards, and as well the, 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 the transfer of these antibiotics or things that we have in the wastewater into the fruits or into the vegetables. So something that we still need more research and yeah. be careful on having only one solution in one basket. We need so many maybe, baskets. Maybe Tamar, I can add a few words regarding uh, the effluent. We are using 90% of effluent to reclaim water for irrigation. So you ask me if it's safe. So generally it's safe because it's a high quality water, but we have to remember there are two things. One, effluent contain um, mostly a, a high quality or average quality of salts. There is a lot of ions uh, in, the, in this effluent. And the, if we're talking about salinity, it's between 200 to, to 350 milligram per liter chloride, that it's uh, much above the background of the environment. And this is, for a long term, can cause a chronic problem and a local desalination pockets. And we can see it already. Uh, we have to remember that during the best development technology of wastewater treatment plant, the, desal the desalination, uh, the, the salts are not degraded. This is one of the problems. Secondly, we have a lot of what's called persistent compounds, mostly persistent organic compounds. I'm working for the last 20 years with this group of contaminants. Uh, these contaminants are, uh, they're, it's, they are persistent to, to biodegradation mostly. And why I say biodegradation? Because the main treatment in the wastewater treatment plant, the best available technology, is biological treatment. It's bacteria that degraded the, the organic molecules. Several, there is many, many molecules that they are more, less degraded and more persistent because they have a double bonding and more aromatic rings and bacteria has to uh, invest more energy in order to break them down. So bacteria said, I don't, I'm lazy, I don't, I have enough organic matter. So why have to invest in, in, in more energy in order to break this persistent compound? So I leave them, leave them alone. What is this, what is, what happened? As a result of this, we got high quality effluent regarding the regulation, but there is a mixture and a soup of a persistent compound like pharmaceutical residues. Uh, Marcelo mentioned the antibiotic. I worked in antibiotic the last 25 years and I'm working with many other pharmaceutical uh, uh, groups. Uh, last 10 years I'm working on chemotherapic drugs that are highly persistent. And even if they are degraded, the, 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 the degradation product are still toxic. And remember the degradation product and uh, so, sorry, chemotherapy drugs are the most toxic uh, drug that people ever develop. It's supposed to kill human cells. So we don't want these residues in our wastewater, but we found them in our best available effluent, in our reclaim effluent that is spreading around in the environment. And we have to take care carefully a lot and, and to give a lot of attention and research uh, in order to get to get rid of them. 
one of the main things that we are doing in our laboratory, in our group, is to develop a, a, actually innovative technologies that knows up as an additional advanced treatment after wastewater treatment, knows how to, to take care of this um, persistent compound and to break them down and to create a effluent that are not toxic anymore. And this is something we are doing for the last 10 years and with a huge success. And this is the solution because you cannot treat this water insufficiently uh, and this is important. Thank you. Marcelo, uh, can you say a few words about research infrastructures studying the effects of climate change in Israel? I think there's one in your background, actually. <laughs> we, to be, we don't have much compared to Australia. Uh, we have little. This, uh, from concerning uh, research on terrestrial ecosystems, we, in infrastructures, we have in Israel uh, only two. One which is the back, another one which is in the Atul Forest that has been managed for the last uh, 25 years by the Weizmann Institute, uh, where they're measuring concentrations of uh, greenhouse gases uh, in the forest and compare that outside the planted forest, the artificial forest in the Northern Main. Uh, concerning uh, 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 sea research, uh, they are both in the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. There are very little uh, now in the last few years have been established uh, research facilities in both seas, something that is pretty new. And uh, in the Lake Inneret, there is a long term monitoring uh, where I've been also measuring. Uh, the, the, con the contamination and levels of the water quality for many years, but not really experiments on the, on a big scale. We are really lacking a uh, real manipulation experiment because the importance of the experimental work like the one we are doing here in, in the Juden Hills is that through experimentation, through uh, manipulations, we're trying to bring what we expect for the future Try to bring it now here. And, uh, otherwise, we need very long term uh, data to see if we have any trends. So, the idea of doing experiments is that you manipulate some type of variable you can see that is the most important one, and you bring it and you manipulate that based on potential scenarios of change due to climate change. And uh, so, that's the importance of my experience as I'm an experimentalist. I like to make experiments and see how the system responds. So these type of facilities, unfortunately, in Israel are still lacking. I have to say that probably we're all undergoing a huge global experiment now with climate change. And uh, to add two things to what Marcella talked, first, the scientists at the Steinhardt Museum are monitoring the changes in the sea over the past century and are seeing huge changes that have to do with the Suez Canal opening and climate change in the Eastern Mediterranean. And there's a lot of cutting edge research on that. And the other uh, project is the National Center for Aquatic Ecology that does the biological monitoring of Israeli rivers to see how they should be managed as best as possible under the current conditions. And I should add to what Dro said, Israel is now on the verge of desalinating water to return water to nature because we've taken so much of the water and the water, the reclaimed sewage water that goes to the rivers is not of the quality required to keep a good, healthy ecosystem. So these are additional challenges that Tel Aviv University scientists are dealing with as we sit here. Dro, you're nodding, so do you want to add another word to that or should we go to the next question? Next question, we just talked a lot about water, you know. Okay. <laughs> so maybe I can say, I saw a question, someone asked if we can uh, take out, so, sorry, Tama? There's, there's several questions that have added up and I can we can stop now and uh, address them. Uh, Marcelo, the one question from Yochai Glick was that if water volume is the problem and with renewable energy availability, can't desalination solve most problems? Uh, I think you've already said something about that, but you want to add another word? As far as we don't have much renewable energy, uh, being used for reducing desalinization, 
but we're still solving one problem by creating another one. So as far as the Israel will not be searching enough for changing the, the dependency on fossil fuels, uh, will not uh, make much change. And now with the, the thing that uh, Israel committed by itself of buying a, a lot of uh, gas that was found in the Eastern Mediterranean coast, at a very high price, also that also make us uh, quite uh, a, a, say a, a, a bad uh, exercise or bad uh, business, but to buy in a very expensive uh, in gas and uh, making that uh, into the energy system in Israel. So, and also gas is highly contaminated. It's less than coal, but definitely it's not the, the alternative for our system. Okay, uh, Ross Koshinsky from Melbourne asks, the effects are very great here in Australia, and we had rainforest burning last year, which is unheard of, and the long drought in Queensland uh, are, uh, are more visible inland areas than in the rainforest themselves. So are you seeing forest in the north of Israel and the usually cooler hills that looks more or less the same but is actually unusually dry, Marcelo? We are seeing, uh, well, the, the, the forest dieback is all around. It's, it's both in the, in, in, in the southern planted areas, in the, in the northern Negev, there were major plantations uh, of the Karen Kayeme, to the JNF. Uh, there were planted forests, uh, uh, there was major forest dieback because of the density of planting was not adapted to the conditions that they are now a, a with very much lower rainfall, and that's also evident in the northern, in the in the, in the Galilee. We must see, we must understand that all the forests that you find, or most of the pine forests that you find in Israel, they are all planted, all planted. So uh, the density of planted that we used to to in the past is part of the of the past of the climate climatic past, and uh, with the new climate. Definitely the densities are not the ones who are capable to stand this, this density. And now there are major programs within the GNF of, major, of making strong thinning of the forest, try to reduce the density of trees that can stand in a more sustainable way on the long term uh, because they are not capable to, to resist under these drought conditions. And the intensity of fire also is something that we find it similar in Australia because of the dryness. The, 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 the dry spells are, uh, are getting longer between rainfall events and as well the, uh, when it first, when we start uh, all here also different from Australia, all our fires in Israel are human made. We have no natural fires that you may have in Australia. In Israel, there are a whole 99.9% they're human related. And as far as the density of the population is increasing and the issues about arson and the, the, the mismanagement of the, of the area, people they are getting into the forest and making a barbecue and letting there the fire, when you have a very hot weather, that's the, one of the, also the trigger. But uh, the conditions are uh, similar in both in Australia and, and in Israel on that point of view. There's another question from Ross Kuczynski, which is addressed to you, actually, though. Can you extract the brine minerals from the desalination effluent and separate the useful elements such as magnesium and use them or trade them? Is this something in your area of expertise? There is a, several projects regarding reuse of elements or compounds from wastewater. Uh, recently, uh, we are doing uh, in Tel Aviv in our um, laboratory uh, the last three years a project in order to recycle um, expensive chemotherapic drugs for patient urine. Uh, it's the same. We know how to, to take the urine, to extract the drug and to uh, uh, produce um, um, actually a powder, a, a high, high quality powder that the company can use again in order to produce drug. The same is for other elements. Uh, in the, I mentioned before industrial wastewater, uh, you know that the coding regulation, any industrial plant 
must uh, do a pretreatment of their uh, uh, contamination, their sewage, in the plant itself. And uh, some of the, the pretreatment solution is to separate between the water to the pollution. And sometimes the pollution is the, the, the resource, the, the raw material for the, for the plant. So they can actually reuse it. So there is several ways how to uh, reuse elements, to, re to take uh, salts or magnesium, calcium, several ions from the concentrate, from the brine. It's a good solution because the concentration is huge. It's quite easy to do, and it's, it could be economic as well. I agree with the remark. Okay, thank you. Uh, and now there's a question from Goldie Birch from Melbourne that's directly back, circles back to COVID-19 as we started with. Dro, can you please clarify if wastewater can carry the novel, novel coronavirus? And if so, and the virus is zoonotic, can birds, fish, then drink the water, pass it back to humans? How much work is being done to use wastewater as a future predictor of potential diseases and outbreaks? Yes. Uh, question from Goldie, please. Thank you for the question. Uh, starting March, uh, during April and May, and May, several groups, in the European groups mainly, uh, already got uh, information regarding the occurrence of uh, coronavirus COVID-19 in wastewater. We, uh, we, I was participating in several uh, webinars regarding this and several people, we actually asked uh, several questions. And the question was, uh, what is the survival potential of COVID-19 in wastewater system and in effluent? And today we know that uh, more than 20 groups around the world find um, coronavirus in, um, in wastewater not in influent, influent yet, but in, in wastewater, in raw wastewater. So this is actually a source of spreading the virus around. And then several questions that must be addressed these days in research, that there, are no, there is no answer yet. Uh, does it behave like a less violent or more violent virus? Or do we have to worry about acquiring this new virus through wastewater system as well? And uh, or do if we are using intense of effluent for irrigation, is it, it can be uh, transferred to a crop by irrigation. Uh, there is no answer regarding this. Uh, and uh, these questions must be uh, addressed and must be uh, under studies, I believe, in the next uh, few months. Now we have a collaboration with the University in Chicago and New University in Chicago regarding several of these questions. And um, especially one of the main questions that there is no answer. If let's take Israel as example, a small environment with several outbreaks. If there is, if all the outbreaks is the same virus, or we are talking about uh, mutations of the virus, no one knows it and it's very easy to, to to, to see and to, to address, to answer this question according to what we found in the wastewater. Today we know there is a high correlation between, between the, the amount of COVID-19 in the wastewater regarding to the amount of the outbreak that we have in a certain area in Israel and other cities in the world. But most important is that there is several population uh, both Israel and mostly in Israel, in the West Bank especially, and Gaza, and in the other developing area around the world, that they, they don't have sufficient or at all wastewater treatment at all. So the wastewater are spreading around in streets, reaching to uh, river streams, groundwater. And if we know that there is COVID-19 in this spreading wastewater, we have to be worried because remember, this wastewater are not going uh, are not uh, uh, going under any disinfection process. And disinfection process in the end of the wastewater treatment is the stage that killing the bacteria and killing the virus. So actually, you can, if this is a zoonotic uh, virus, you can say if wastewater spreading around and animals, birds, other uh, mammals can go around and 
uh, interact with this wastewater, maybe they can be reinfected and spreading again the virus to the nearby society. And this will be a cycle of infection. And this is a very, very hot question in the science today. No one has answer if reinfection can cause by animal that uh, exposed to wastewater. Uh, I believe th this question has to be answered in two, three months after the first outbreak, but it will take a year, I believe, till we have answers, but this is a critical answer to be answered, a question to be answered. Okay, thank you, Dro. A lot of serious things to think about. I take it, but no, not an effluent yet, so. I, there's something to hope for, uh, at mm -hmm. least. We do have another question that's a, a, a slightly different topic from you, Hai Glik. There has been no mention of the Dead Sea in this webinar. Can you mention what's happening there and what will happen? Do either of you want to address this question? <clears throat> I believe the drawer is... is the, the Dead Sea, it's, um, it's a big issue because the Dead Sea is disappearing every year. You know, there is one meter less, the level go, drop down one meter every, every year. And this is a big issue. Uh, and it's actually, it's not a sea, it's a concentrated brine uh, for many, many years ago. Uh, but it's a very, very important uh, environment, not because of specific ecosystem that live there, because the water in the in the ocean in the sea in the in the lake sea of the Yamamela actually holding the ground around and you can see all the boroughs developing uh, in the last 20 years this is a huge problem for the settlements and the kibbutz and moshav and the tourism area around the Judea desert and the and the dead sea coastline uh, all this area is under a huge threat of the of the dis disappearing of the, the sea. Uh, the main uh, solution I think uh, that can be for this um, uh, problem is to fill up the, the Dead Sea with water. And uh, the solution is called uh, the Red Dead Sea um, Tunnel. I remember when I was kids, quite many years ago, still uh, the People talk about the tunnel that's supposed to give water uh, from the Mediterranean to the Dead Sea and we can actually uh, produce electricity by the, the elevation differences. Uh, afterwards, there is a, a solution for Red Dead. Red is the, the Red Sea nearby a lot uh, towards the Arava region to the Dead Sea in order to, to give water. And by doing this, we can desalinate water for Jordan Jordan, as I mentioned before, it's in a huge scarcity of water. It's supposed to be a solution of uh, several countries today. It's supposed to be Israel, it's supposed to be Jordan mostly, and the Palestinian Authority as well that live between. Um, but still, there is no agreement how it's going to look and uh, who is going to control. There is a lot of geopolitical and political issues. It became clearer the last three years, but it's still not a solution that I can say, okay, the solution will be alternative B or alternative A or alternative C, but it must be uh, uh, answered because the Dead Sea is dropping every year and it will be dis it will disappear and the area around the Dead, the Dead Sea suffering a lot. And the solution is a geopolitical solution that's supposed to solve the Dead Sea problem and to give more water, drinking water to the, uh, to the citizens around and to give a lot of water for agriculture, irrigation, desert agriculture. Yeah. Marcelo, please. You can say that the, the Dead Sea shrinkage is the major ecological disaster in Israel uh, now for many years and the public of Israel and also outside Israel, they're not much aware of this major ecological uh, disaster. Uh, because the shrinkage of the, the Dead Sea is a result of a misconcept of water management in Israel through the, the construction of the national water career that took water from the lake in Eret 
to that do irrigation in the northern Negev and in the central area of Israel. So that's something that would be impossible to think in nowadays, taking water from a lake and using that for irrigation in the desert. Something that's part of the concept of uh, water management and land use management in uh, from the last uh, eight years, let's say. So uh, the consequences there, as we say before, the no-free lunch. And the no-free lunch is that you have some type of agriculture, but it's not sustainable because it's not it's depending from the water coming from an area that has no water. Uh, and you're paying the, the consequences of the disappearance of the Dead Sea. Uh, now the real disappearance of the Dead Sea is half of it has really disappeared from Engedi north. That's the real, but still, what we can see is part of the of the Dead Sea. And from that point until what we call Embokek and where you find the major hotels, they are all artificial. They are all uh, ponds that they are used to evaporate and lose the less water, the the, the very few water they have for producing the industry of minerals and producing uh, uh, elements that are used for fertilizers and Israel is getting money from that. Uh, but it's a private company and uh, the environmental effects of the whole of this industry uh, to the region is not really being paid by these companies, both in Jordan and in Israel. And uh, well, we, we know that the only possibility is that the both Jordan, Israel and the Palestinians get agreed and try to see if the Red Sea, Dead Sea uh, carrier of water is an alternative. And uh, the potential that Israel will use the Lake Kinneret and with decimated water open the Degania uh, Dam uh, that is now closing the Jordan River. The Jordan River is not really a river, it's just a a brine a stream with the wastewater flowing on it. It's not really a real, real river, uh, but it's the, the major or one of the historical rivers that we have in Israel that is, is only a small stream. Um, and we hope that there will be uh, more water to the Dead Sea. Some of the scenarios, the future, future scenarios are talking about of some flooding, uh, increased some flooding effects in the Arab area and in that will potentially will give more water to the Dead Sea, but definitely it's all about management and we need to take care of that. Thank you very much, Marcelo, and thank you very much, Dro. I will add that our founding, Zionist founding fathers came to conquer the desert in Israel. It turns out it's much more complicated to conquer a desert than we ever thought, both in Australia and in Israel. And the challenge is how to learn how to manage it sustainably for the next generations. So thank you all for joining us today. And thank you for your insightful answers on these questions. And for other information, both the Tel Aviv University website and the Steinert Museum websites are available. And of course, you're cordially invited to join us in the other Tel Aviv University webinars. So thank you. And uh, good evening, all. Thank you. Thank you.